Lifehouse. Before we start, we want to give a quick shout out to anyone new to the thing we called online church. And in case you are new, we want to give you three ways to fully maximize your online experience. Tip number one, don't watch alone. Mm -hmm. Share this video with your friends and family on whatever platform you're watching from. You never know who needs this right now. Tip number two, get rid of all distractions. Silence your devices or put them on. Do not disturb. Take notes during the message. Whatever you need to do to stay focused and most importantly, stay with us to the very end. Absolutely. Tip number three, interact with us. Drop a comment or two mm -hmm. and then join us after the service on Zoom for a quick and casual conversation about the sermon with me and some of the other Lifehouse leaders. Lifehouse, we hope you're ready to meet God right where you're at. So if you're ready for church like we are, join us when we say, let's go. What's up Lifehouse fam? Woo! Listen, we about to praise this awesome God. Can we just raise a hallelujah? Is that all right? If you're joining in on our church online platform, like put some praise hands in the chat or something. So excited to worship with y'all. Hey. Hey, yeah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a
serve a risen Savior. Listen, I had somebody, it was a minute ago, but I had somebody be like, you're the guy that jumps around a lot. <laughs> I was like, hey. but it was true, you know? And, and it made me think, like, when people see your praise, they don't always know the story behind it. <laughs> and I want to encourage y'all, everybody on this stage, I can say, am I right, has a story, has a testimony. We're about to sing this song, My Testimony. Listen, I jump as high as I do, I sing as loud as I do, whether my voice cracks or not, whatever. I give him everything because of what he has brought me through, y'all. I got to You know what I'm saying? Because he's been so good to me. He's been so good. The word says we overcome by the blood of the lamb, meaning the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And the second thing is what? The word of our testimony. So right now in this moment, I, I want to invite you. We're giving it all right now. I want to invite you to give it all. Sing as loud as you can. Clap as loud as you can. Dance in your living room if you're there. Because of what he's brought you through. So let's sing this song together. Hey, my testimony. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Yeah. I believe in signs and wonders, I have resurrection power. This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm testified This is my testimony This is my testimony yeah. Let's see come together Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. I hope you know that. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony.
Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony oh, This is my testimony From dead to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is our testimony. Give God a shout of praise. chat right now if you know that God has been good and faithful to you if you know that God has been merciful and kind and consistent put like an amen or something just to let people know yes God has been great in my life I've seen him move I've seen him work and this is why y'all this is this is why we praise, this is why we worship, because he's worthy of it. Right now in this moment, we don't want to rush his presence. Like wherever you're at, just take some time to sit in his goodness. God, we worship you right now. We lift up your name because you are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are patient, you are kind. We bless you, Jesus. For all that you are, all that you've done, all that you will do, we trust in your promises, God. Your promises are yes and amen. We thank you, God. And it is an honor to be able to sing to you and to praise you. Your faithfulness to 
give God some praise right now for his faithfulness? Can we give God some praise right now for his faithfulness? We thank you, God. God is so good, y'all. Listen, if you are tuning in, if you're visiting for the first, the second, the third time, the fourth time, we're just excited. We're excited that you're tuning in, that you're joining with us. We're happy that you're here. If you love Starbucks, we got something for you. Make sure you fill out the digital connection card. Make sure you do that if you want to give you a Starbucks gift card just to say thank you for joining us. As a matter of fact, Lifehouse family, can we make some noise for our guest as loud as you can? Hey, hey! Love y'all. At this point, we just want to pass it on to Lacey and Edward as we continue to worship God and give him. This is the part of our service where we want to give you the opportunity to continue to worship, form your heart, and fuel the vision of LifeHouse through your financial giving. If you are a guest today and LifeHouse is not the church you call home, please, there is no obligation or pressure to give today. In fact, this service is our gift to you. But what we are about to say together is something different and something we will start to incorporate each week to help us prepare our minds and our hearts to give, along with helping us think counterculturally about the money and resources God entrusts us with. We're gonna say this prayer together and the words will be on the screen. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds, who withstand the culture's lie that the more or less I have, the happier I'll be, who put their trust in you as provider, believing that you own all things, have all power, and in you is no lack. You entrust me to steward all you've given me for the forwarding of your kingdom. Give me the grace and strength to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may entrust me with true riches. Above all, I am determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. To give today, simply text GIVE to the number on your screen or go to givetolifehouse.com. Lifehouse, let's worship the Lord through our giving. Now, back to the service. Hey everybody, my name is John Ware and this is my wife Kristen and we are super excited to be planting a brand new church in the incredible city of Newport News, Virginia launching this September 2017. Look at all that God has done. Well, good morning, LifeHouse family. It's Pastor John here. I want to say welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today at LifeHouse Church Online. Let's celebrate. We are celebrating three years of LifeHouse Newport News. We launched our church September 17th, 2017, and we are celebrating the third Sunday in September. 
September. We are celebrating today three years. You saw a little bit of what God has done, and we just seriously want to just pause and say, God, thank you for all you've done, and we're thankful for all that God has done, but we are pumped about what God wants to do next. So, man, let's just give God some praise. Put some praise hands in the comment section. You know, it, it just let, let's just celebrate all that God has done. And two, if it's your first time here with us today, we want to say welcome. Thank you so much for joining us to today. We believe this brand new series, My Testimony, is going to really, really help you catch the heart and vision of our church. So, so whether you've been here since the beginning of Lifehouse Church or you are a brand new person watching us today, man, this series that we're starting today is going to give you the vision and heartbeat of our church along with telling you some of the stories within our church that embody the vision that God has given us. And, and that's the series we're starting today. It's called My Testimony. And this series has two big components to it. First off, we, we want to share with you the vision of our church over the next four weeks. And with each part of our vision, we want to share with you a story of somebody within our church that embodies and shows that part of our vision. So what is the vision of our church? Lifehouse Church exists to help all people experience life change through Christ by following Jesus, doing life together, getting in the game, and leaving a legacy. We want people to experience the life change that Jesus offers by doing four practical, broad things. Following Jesus, doing life together, getting in the game, and leaving a legacy. And over the next four weeks, those are the four points that we're going, going to explore together as we dive in and we say, man, what does God want to do in the next three, five, seven, ten years of our church? So thank you for joining us. Look, the first part today that we're going to, to check out is helping people follow Jesus. Now you might say, duh, John, like, Duh, like, yeah, Jesus, he's kind of important in this whole Christianity thing. Like, we want people to follow Jesus, duh. But at the same time, I don't think we understand how truly difficult that really is within our culture. We have some tremendous challenges whenever it comes to following Jesus. And what we could actually sum up that following Jesus in is we want people to be disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus that, that say, right, and, and, we, and we talked about this last week, we said, we said that a disciple is somebody that, that, that wants to be intentionally shaped and formed into the image of somebody and something. And that's why we say when we, when we want to be disciples of Jesus, essentially what we want to, to do is we want to be intentionally shaped and formed into the image of Jesus. But we've got some tremendous challenges when it comes to being shaped and formed into the image of Jesus, especially within our culture. Why? Because you have got a culture and world that is warring and doing everything it possibly can to shape you and form you into its image. The culture is strong. The world is strong. And it wants to take you and shape you and form you into its image. But also, too, we've got a couple different challenges. A, we live in a very unique culture in that we actually don't want to follow Jesus. We want him to follow us. And, and we've actually created a Christian subculture where, honestly, we think Jesus exists to follow us. That Jesus went and lived a perfect and sinless life and Jesus endured opposition and Jesus endured pain and suffering all so that we would not have to walk the same path that he did. And people have created a Jesus that is kind of like a sugar daddy, that all Jesus wants to do is bless you. And what we talked about a couple weeks back is people have actually dumbed Christianity down to being this moral, therapeutic deism, where all Jesus wants to do is to just make you to be a good person, is just to, you know, you know, a good moral person or, or, or just to be therapeutic. It's just like Jesus just wants to make you happy, just be a cosmic back, back rub to you. 
And then the, the last part of that term, deism, is just kind of like God doesn't want to be all up in your business. He just wants to be some force out there letting you know there's good vibes and there's, and there's good feelings out there. And what we've actually dumbed Christianity down to is moral therapeutic deism. It just wants you to be good, happy, and some force and vibe out there. But if you know anything about following Jesus and what Jesus even said about following himself, that is nothing about or who Jesus is when, whenever he says to follow him. Jesus did not just come to take a bad person and to help them become good. He came to take dead people who were spiritually dead and far from God and give them eternal spiritual life and to essentially make them what? Alive. He didn't just come to make you you happy. He didn't just come to be just like a good cheerleader in your life. Jesus came and Jesus walked a path of suffering and pain and hurt and heartache and betrayal. But at the same time, he was following his father's will. And sometimes what that shows us is following the will of God is not always daisies and lollipops and popsicles and just the life of complete ease. Sometimes following the will of God will take you to places where it will be painful, full of of heartache and hurt and betrayal. And sometimes the will of God is the hardest, right? And then too, we see Jesus just just doesn't want to be a far off vibe. He wants to be in relationship with you. But that's the kind of culture we fight within Christianity is we've got to almost, if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to actually see what kind of Christian subculture has Christianity created and created Jesus in the image that they want him to be instead of who Jesus actually is. Because if we're going to follow him, follow the real Jesus in, in scripture, we've got to throw off these preconceived notions of who we want Jesus to be. So why? So we don't have Jesus following us. We actually turn and follow Jesus. Here's the thing, right? We live in a culture of self. I say this all the time because it's so true and you need to be reminded of it. A culture of self, self self-actualization, self-care, self-focus, self-image. We even created the selfie. And the thing is, right, how is that working for us? We live in a culture of self. So how is having a culture of self working for us? I believe we are the most comforted, fed, hobbied, studied, educated, connected, technologically advanced country ever. And what is the result of it? We are the most depressed, medicated, with, with, with a mental health epidemic of epic proportions on the, on the horizon and currently going on now. We can see what happens whenever we have a culture of self and what that ultimately leads you. And that's what the culture is trying to, to, and and here's the key word, disciple you to focus on. Self, self, just find my true self, just self, self, self. Why are we so focused on self yet? We are the most, are you seeing what I'm saying? But Jesus offers us a different way, a different path, a different way of saying, follow me. And what does Jesus actually say about self? What you'll, what, what you'll actually see about Jesus said about self. He said, actually, you don't want to, to indulge yourself, become your true self. What Jesus actually says is you actually want to die to yourself. Actually deny yourself. And you're like, hold up, John. This, you know, I don't know. I just don't know about this whole deny stuff. That's why we've got to examine exactly what Jesus said. Why? Because the truth is this here, right? Whenever you deny yourself, less of you means there's more of him. As you deny yourself, and here's the thing, right? As that, you know, as that sin-filled nature you have is taken over by Christ and taken over by the Holy Spirit, and as there's less of you, there's more of him to fill you and then go through you. Jesus says it's at that point you do find your true self, and that is yourself as a child of God, right with God and right standing with God. And that's why we, as a part of our vision at Lifehouse Newport News, we want people to follow Jesus. And here's the thing, not a Jesus created in their own minds. Not some Jesus created by culture. We want them to follow a Jesus that is found in scripture. That is not a US version of Jesus, but it is a Bible-based 
Jesus himself, what he says about himself version of following Jesus. And that's what we're going to speak on today. Is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And then we're going to tell you a story about somebody within our church that has done that. The first thing, a disciple of what we see, of what I see uh, from Jesus' teachings, from Jesus' comprehensive teachings about what, is, what it actually means to be a disciple. What does Jesus say? I believe the first thing we see Jesus saying is this, a disciple reckons. And he's like, I'm, I'm going to do the most pastoral thing ever. We're going to do three R's, okay? So, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll be like, boom, 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 R, 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 okay? He'll, well, here's the first one here. A disciple reckons, reckons. You might say, we don't really use that word a whole lot, a whole lot in this culture. We don't, right? A disciple reckons. What does that word mean? Reckons means, or to reckon means to compute, calculate, and weigh the cost. To compute, calculate, and weigh the cost. Essentially what this is saying to us is we have to actually consider the cost and what it will cost us to actually follow Jesus. Because honestly, this gets to the root of why we want to follow Jesus. Because honestly, what you see in, in scripture is so many people started to follow Jesus, because he met a physical need, because they were hungry, right? It, it, you know, what is it? After Jesus fed the 5,000, man, people were like, yo, this dude like feeding people. I'm following him. He's like going, doing like DoorDash before there was DoorDash, Postmates before there was Postmates. Like this dude is feeding people. I'm going to follow him. I'm like, you know, and then it's, it says that thousands of, of people followed him. But then whenever Jesus told them something difficult, and hard and something that they did not agree with. Scripture says that they turned and no longer followed him. And we've got to be careful of this same temptation where we start to follow Jesus because we need him to fix something, right? And this is what I've seen, right? People come to him because their marriage is broken. Like, we need God. Our marriage is broken. We need God. My kid's going crazy. I need God. My finances are a wreck. I need God. My car broke down. I need God. I need Jesus. And here's the thing. That, for so many people, that is what draws them to Jesus. But then, the thing is, we've got, you know what? That can be a great starting point because typically God can and will use moments of pain in relationships, within finances, with our vocation. He'll use those moments to draw us to himself so we can see he's He's there. And that's what I love about God. He'll take all things and make it work for your good and for his glory if you let him. But the thing is this, right? That draws you to him. But then there comes a point to where you've got to say, if I follow him and actually follow him and not just use him to fill some sort of temporary need that I have, you're going to have to consider and weigh the cost of what it means to follow Christ. Because Jesus was so clear. He said, it's going to cost you something. And that's what I love in Luke chapter 14. And it talks about how Jesus, it said the crowds were following him. Following, like just crowds like, oh man, this dude's intriguing. This dude's pretty cool. This dude, he's got some great teachings. He's feeding people. He's healing people. Like I want to go after him. Yes. But then it said Jesus turned to the crowds. It says Jesus turned to the crowds and said this, right? Luke chapter 14, verses 26 through 33. Now, here's the thing. This is so funny because... You know, Jesus had a pretty large church. He had a lot of people coming to his church following him. And Jesus actually, by saying stuff like this, shrinks his following and shrinks his church. And I'm just like, this is really interesting. And just how sometimes, even within Christianity, I have been guilty of, and preachers have been guilty of, saying things that are kind of, that, saying things that might affect, Offend people, or here's the thing, right? not saying the things that might actually challenge people and possibly offend them because we don't want them to actually leave. But you see Jesus doing the complete opposite. Jesus is like, hey, I see you're following me. It's great. It's awesome. But let me make sure you fully understand what you're getting yourself into as, you, as you're following me. And this is one of the things he said, right? Starting in verse number 14, or ex, ex, excuse me, chapter 14, verse number 25. Uh, through number 33, it says this here, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me, these are some strong words here, and does not hate 
his father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, now you might be like, no, but I thought Jesus, we were supposed to like love each other. I thought he said, don't, you know, you shouldn't hate people. So, so what Jesus is doing here is he's using a hyperbole. He's essentially using a figure of speech that exacerbates something to make a point, right? Jesus isn't saying you hate your father and mother. Like, what? Is that, no. What, what he's saying is he's saying, look, my, your commitment to me has to far outweigh your commitment to any other earthly relationship. He says, and, and then in verse number 27, he says this, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Then in verse number 28, he goes on, he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against them with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciples. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? He's making sure people understand what exactly what they're getting into. Because honestly, I think what we've done is we've almost taken Jesus and said, Jesus just wants to just add to you. Just, 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 he just wants to give you everything. And, and what you can actually see here is that, yes, Jesus does add to you. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, I think we have lost the fact that following Jesus at times will have a cost. It will cost you in some ways, in temporary ways. But that's the whole point of it. Here's, here's, a, here's the thing, right? As, as we follow Jesus and follow him, there is a cost to pay, but it pales in comparison to what we gain. It pales in comparison to having a peace that surpasses all, all understanding. It pales to the fact that we get to spend eternity with God. It pales to the fact that we become more like Jesus, our creator. We've got to know it costs us something, but it doesn't compare to what we gain. And here's the thing. If you're going to follow Jesus, and if we're going to follow Jesus at LifeHouse, and you are a part of this church, I want to let you, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I don't, I don't want to put, I want to tell you, following Jesus will cost you something, but it pales in comparison to the promise and the goodness and the grace that Jesus gives in return for who he is and what he's done. A disciple reckons, considers the cost. Secondly, though, a disciple repents. I beat this like a drum. I, I beat this concept of repentance daily. Why? Because repentance is central to following Jesus and being a Christ follower. Now that, now that word re, repentance within our culture, we kind of have to detox it some and realize that repent does not simply, is not simply a feeling of just where you feel bad for doing something and you are, and you are remorseful. That's a part of it, okay? That, that, that is a part of it, what you feel. But when you actually look at this word repent, in the Greek language and what Jesus actually used and said, you can actually see that Greek word for repent actually, it, it actually means two things. One, a change of mind, meaning you, you change the way you think about somebody or something. Essentially what Jesus was saying was, is, <clears throat> is rethink, rethink. One of the first things that Jesus preached and taught whenever he came on this scene as the full display of God in the form of flesh was he said this. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, Matthew 4, Matthew 4, 17. And you see this concept where he would tell different groups of people, sinners, religious leaders, religious rulers, government officials, people that he, he would say, repent. And what he was telling them wasn't just feel bad for something you did wrong. He was saying, I want you to rethink everything you've known about everything so you will see it the way that I see it so you will live the way that I live. The scripture is clear. As a man thinks, so he is. You know, all of these, you know, uh, I don't know what to call them, like kind of just like um, new age philosophers that say, oh, if you think it, it'll happen. And if you, so you think, so, so you are. That's all stolen from the Bible, <laughs> flat out at the end of the day, right? And I mean, the, the Bible has the, has the, the corner office on this whole concept of changing the way you think leads to a change of what you 
do. And that's what, Je- that, that's what was one of the foundation of Jesus's, uh, of Jesus's message was you've got to rethink everything according to what God says. And that, in, you see, and, and really the process of that is first off this, surrendering. And realizing the way you think is not right. Realizing the way that you have been cultivated or cultivated and crafted to think by the culture, naturing or naturing, nature, nurture, whatever, the ways that we have been crafted, we have to surrender those to Jesus and say, Jesus, I surrender what I think about money, about sexuality, about character, about technology, about politics, about race, about gender, about marriage, about dating, about everything. And you say, Jesus, I surrender what I've been taught, what I even think, and I put it all in. And I say, Jesus, I need you to help me rethink all of these areas according to what your standard and what your reference point is. And that's the way we describe it at LifeHouse. Whenever we say, when you repent, essentially what you are doing is you're taking your whole life, all, 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 all of these different areas, right? And the way that I describe it is kind of like poker chips, where just think of you've, you've got 10 or 12 poker chips and you're playing a poker game and you've got that term all in, where, where essentially what you're saying is I've got, a, I've got a hand here that I have total trust in that this hand is going to win me the game. Therefore, I'm going to take all that I've got, all of these chips, and I'm going to put it in. And that's the way that I describe repentance and following Jesus to people is when you are all in, you say, I take all of these areas, all of the ones that I just said, and what you're doing is you're putting it into the middle of the table and you're saying, Jesus, I need you to help me rethink all of those areas according to what you say, because I want to think the way you think so I can act the way you act and I can treat people the way you treat people and I can love people the way that you love people and I can be informed the way that you are informed so I can go out and be your hands and feet and representation to the world around me. It is repentance. And that's why y'all this, that is why Jesus, Jesus had specific interactions with people where, you know, specifically one, this rich young, this rich young ruler is what they called him. Like he was rich, young, and he was in charge. What we all want, right? He had money. He was young and good looking and he was in charge. And he came to Jesus. Hey, oh, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus could tell he was, he, he, he was like trying to, to almost corner Jesus and try to like, how do I, I've got all the things that, that, this, that this earth could possibly offer me now. How do I get eternal life as well? And Jesus said, go and sell your possessions, lay it down and come and follow me. And what did he say? He walked away sad. He walked away knowing that was such a God in his life that he could not put that all, all in and follow him because he was so consumed with it being his God. We all have one or two specific areas in our lives where this applies to us. Are you like, yeah, lying, yeah, I, yeah, Lord, I give you lying. Yeah, God, I give you this. God, I give you that. Oh, money? Oh, you know, hmm. Well, God, churches have abused money. Therefore, I'm not gonna be generous. Well, you know, and, and, you, know you know what I'm saying? It's just like, you, you've, you've gotta surrender. And say, Jesus, I need you to help me rethink things according to the way you say it. I also think about the story of Zacchaeus. I think it's, uh, it's Luke chapter 19 where, where, where you've got Zacchaeus who was a punk. Like, you know, he was a tax collector. He would always charge people more than what he should have just so he could take some off the top and put it in his bank account and people hated Zacchaeus. And it says that Jesus was walking, but Zacchaeus was short, but Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. It says he climbed a tree and saw him. But, but the thing was, Zacchaeus didn't see him, only Jesus saw him. And he, called Z- and he called Zacchaeus down and he said, hey Zacchaeus, I'm gonna be at your house today. I'm gonna come and hang out with you. We're gonna have some chicken wings, hang out. And so Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house and they were in conversation and then it says, that Zacchaeus told Jesus himself. He said, look, I know I've screwed people over. I know I've messed people up. I'm gonna go back and pay back what I took from them four, four, four times over. Essentially what Zacchaeus was saying was, I recognize the way that I was doing things was wrong. I'm going all in, but it's not gonna be just 
all in in thought. I'm, it's going to be all in in the way I act and in in what I do on a practical level. And then you see Zacchaeus going and putting faith and putting works and actually putting it into his, into his practical life of the repentance that he confessed to Jesus. See, that, that's what's so important about repentance. It's not just what you, yeah, okay. No, it, yes, Jesus will save you if you turn to him. But at the same time, it's got to work itself out practically into all of these different areas. And that actually leads me into my third point, right? A disciple reckons. You consider the cost. A disciple repents. And that's what I, honestly, I pray for our church that we would be a repenting church. Because y'all, honestly, when you turn to Jesus, right? When you turn to Jesus, you're going to drift. <laughs> we all do it. Join the club, right? You're going to drift. But that's why you've got to have a life of repentance, of saying, Jesus, show me where I've drifted. God, show me where I've gone off track. Show me where my thoughts haven't been right. Show me where my words haven't been right. God, show me sexually where I've been off. Show me physically where I've been off. Show me emotionally, maritally, maritally, relationally. Show me so I can get back and turn and repent and go to you. God, help me rethink. I, I, I pray you see this. A disciple reckons. A disciple re repents. But then thirdly and lastly, a disciple I just forgot it. <laughs> oh, here we go. A disciple reorients. A disciple reorients, or probably a better way of putting this, a disciple reprioritizes. And this is where it gets down into your practical life. Because honestly, let me tell you what our culture struggles with. We make Jesus, get this, an add on. Jesus becomes just somebody else or something else we consume and put into our life and just and just do this, add to our life. But Jesus doesn't want to be a hobby. Jesus didn't die on the cross in your place and for your sins and give you life to be a hobby in your life. Jesus died in your place and for your sin, rose and defeated Satan's sin and death and got eternal life and gives it to you as a free gift by grace through faith. He did that because he doesn't want just a part of you. He wants all of you and he wants to be the center of your life, right? And here's the thing, right? Let me show this to you. This is what we do within our culture, right? Our culture tell, tell, tells you it's all about you, right? The self is at the center. It's you, man. It's your life, brother. Yo life. Live it up. Hakuna Matata. YOLO. Do it, right? Self is at the center. And then, and then you've got all these different areas. You know, you, you got your relationships. You know, you got your finances, you know, you, you got your vocation, your job. Um, what else? Talk, talk to me here. Um, you've got somebody in a different service. I think it was last, last year they said coffee, you know, which I think is really, really, inter in, really interesting, you know, and then you got your, you know, uh, your, uh, I don't know, sports, you know, where you've got your like, uh, what's it called, that? nightlife or, you know, friends. Why am I so bad at trying to figure out what to say? Friends or um, stuff like that. And then what we typically do, right, is, or, or you know, then, then you got like kids, marriage. And then, like, oh man, you know what? I need to get a little bit of Jesus up in here. Yes, I need to get... A little, and, and really, that's what, that's what our culture teaches you. Jesus is just something you add to your life to make your life a little bit better. Right, you, man, you, man, you get a little bit of Jesus up in there, man, it'd be all good. But do you see the difference in, in what Jesus himself said? L let me actually tell you, right? In Jesus' framework, in following Jesus, and why we're so passionate about this at Lifehouse Church, is we don't believe Jesus wants to be in add on in your life. He wants to actually be the center. He wants to be the center. He wants to be the priority. He wants to be the one that then, here's the thing, right? Jesus, since he is in the center now, whenever you follow him, he is the one that informs and sets boundaries for and sets standards for and actually leads and guides and really is the center of all of these different 
areas to where now Jesus isn't just a add-on. He is the center. He is the focus. He is the reference point. He is the fuel. He is the vision. He is the purpose behind your life. And that's why when he is the center, it can't not but affect your practical everyday life, the way you handle your time, the way you handle your finances, the way you handle and view your relationships, the way you handle and view your social interactions and your social relationships, the way you do everything. Jesus changes everything. And this is the kind of sold outness. I don't even know if that's a word. Sold outness that God is looking for and God is asking of us. A disciple reckons, considers the cost. A disciple repents, turns to God and rethinks everything. And then a disciple reprioritizes and takes itself out of the center and puts Jesus within the center. I love what C.S. Lewis said uh, in, in his book, mere Christianity. He was talking about this one chapter. He said this. He, he was describing this concept. He said, when I was a child, I often had a toothache. And, and I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something which would deaden the pain for that night and let me get to sleep. But I did not go to my mother, at least not till the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not go was this. I did not doubt she would give me the aspirin but I knew she would also do something else. I knew she would take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more, which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists, I knew they started fiddling about with all sorts of different teeth, which had not yet begun to ache yet. They would not let sleeping dogs lie. If you gave them an inch, they took a mile. Now, if I may put it that way, our Lord is like a dentist. If you give him an inch, he will take a mile. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of one particular sin, which they are ashamed of, or which is obviously spoiling daily life, like a bad temper or drunkenness. Well, he will cure it all right, but he will not stop there, that he may be all you asked. But if once you call him in, he will give you the full treatment. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He doesn't just want to fix one area of your life and just be some just sort of just like add on to your life. He wants to give you the full treatment. I want to tell you or show you a a story of two people within our church that came to us that embodied these three R's and are following Jesus. Check this, check this story out. Hi, my name's Gerardo. My name is Tyra. And um, as, a, as a young kid, um, I grew up uh, getting picked on and bullied a lot. And Like Gerardo, I was also picked on in high school and I was also um, someone that stayed alone all the time. I think I was 16 um, where I was always depressed. I felt like that nobody loves me and I felt alone. My low self-esteem and my low self-confidence kept me from believing that God would love me the way that I hear that other people have received God's love. I was also angry inside. I was also wondering why why God doesn't love me, you know, the way, or why wasn't I blessed with this, or why wasn't I blessed with that, or why do I got to go through the things that I have to go through, and, you know, and I'm such a nice person, I'm such a good person, I'm such a good-hearted person, but I was always wondering why the next person over here, um, got the things they did and they didn't do the half of the things that I did. As I grew up, uh, I did start feeling better about myself. I would have some good days and some bad days. And um, I always knew about God. I wasn't raised in church to go to church every Sunday, but I knew like God fearing God. I didn't know like God's love. I was, I was lost, but In the midst of all that trouble, I felt like God was still tugging on me. I felt like I needed a restart of my life before I can actually 
join a church. So this was back in October of 2019. Uh, me and Geraldo were already in a relationship for like a year and some change. I kind of let him know why I wasn't a person that attended church on a regular. I told him that basically I felt like I needed to be perfect before I can get myself into church. And he literally told me that God wants you in your mess. And so when he said that, it clicked because I have never heard that God wants you when you broke it. I'm thinking that I had to be this perfect person to present myself to church and then God would love me on that level. Uh, I saw a message uh, come through on my timeline. Um, I, I watched it and it, 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 really, it really took a very, very toll on me. You know, um, that's when I started to give God my full attention, give God my, you know, all of me instead of half of me. I felt like a weight had been just lifted up off me. Like, you know, a lot of stuff I was dealing with. Um, I had a Sunday off and she uh, took me, brought me to this, uh, brought me to Life House. And when I walked in, the, the energy in the, the church, it, it felt so alive, like, all you seen was smiles, and it just felt real, real good there. And so, um, Gerardo ended up having a Sunday off, and we ended up going to church um, together, and we both enjoyed it still. And then they had a, um, I think like a Bible study type called Fresh Start, and that's when things really started to hit home for me. That's when I really got to know God's love for me and I was introduced to a whole nother God than the God that I knew about growing up. And just hearing about how much someone loved me gave me, you know, the boost and the confidence that I needed. And after um, Fresh Start, we were um, given the option to get baptized. And so me and Geraldo got baptized together. So that was a big, that was a big, that was a big step in our relationship. I feel like everything is lining up because we have put our focus on him. We did recently get engaged, so um, I feel like everything is just finally falling into place for me because I, I no longer think of myself as having control over my own life. Um, I kind of just live it, leave it up to him and I just Instead of praying for things that I want now, I pray God's will for me. You know, I've come a, a long way from uh, suicidal thoughts. And one thing I believe is if I'm not dead, God's not done with me. And I said yes when I found out God loved me even in the midst of my mess. Follow Jesus. We exist as a church to help all people experience life change through Christ by following Jesus, doing life together, getting in the game, and leaving a legacy. And we want people to follow Jesus. And possibly today, that is your next step. Maybe today you've never actually put a line in the sand and said, I want to follow Jesus. I just don't want him to be an add-on. I just don't want him to revolve around my life. I just don't want it to be, you know, Jesus just come and fix something and then peace out, Jesus. You said, you know what? I, I need to actually count the cost, repent, and then in turn reprioritize my life to put him at the center. If that is you today, and possibly today you're doing this for the first time or possibly you're doing it again, because you know you've gone off. I want to invite you just to say yes. That's the way we do it here. Say yes. And we believe that when you say yes, what you actually do is that is the sign of faith in your heart that you're saying, God, I'm going to give you access to my life. I give my life to you. I accept what you did on the cross in my place and for, and for my sin. And I want you to be Lord of my life and Savior of my life. We, we want to give you that opportunity right now. I'm just going to ask you to say yes on the count of three, wherever you are, you can say it loudly, quietly, whatever fits your style or whatever fits your kind of like environment. If you're at the gym or if, or if you're watching on your phone or if you're driving or something like that, you just want to say yes. 
I'm gonna invite you to do that when I count to three. Ready? One, two, three. Set. Just say yes now. Hey, if you said yes today, I wanna say welcome to the family first off. And what I wanna do is pray with you really quick and just bring you into the family of God and put your hand in Jesus' hand. Repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I give you my life today and I receive new life in Christ. Thank you for dying on the cross in my place and for my sin. I receive new life in you. Thank you. I want to follow you. I reckon the cost. I repent. I go all in. And God, today, I want to reprioritize and put you at the center. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, we want to say welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. We, are, we know the Spirit of God was speaking to you and drawing you today. And we just want to say welcome. We believe the best is yet to come in your life as, you, as you've made a decision to follow Jesus today. Look, if you did say that prayer, if you did make a decision to follow Jesus today, man, would you please reach out to us? Would you just please let us know? I promise we're not going to bombard you with a bunch of stuff. We're not going to like be all up in your grill. But at the same time, we want to just know so we can follow up, so we can follow up with you. And so we can give you a few tools to be successful in what it means to follow Jesus. So would you just text yes, excuse me, to 757-690-2401 and it'll send you back a prompt. Would you just fill out the information there and let us know what Jesus has done in your life? This is what we're going to do right now. We're just going to celebrate. Typically during this time we have a real somber song or something like that, but we're going to actually today sing and celebrate exactly what we sang earlier. We sang this song, My Testimony. One of the parts of that song, it says this, God, if you're not dead, I'm not done. And we, and that's, and, and really that's what, and that's what we believe at Lifehouse. We believe if you're at this church and you're living and breathing, no matter how messed up and jacked up you are, we believe if you are still breathing, if you're not dead, you are not done. He wants to help you experience life change through Christ by following Jesus, doing life together, getting in the game and leaving a legacy. And we want to invite you right now, stand up on, on your feet and sing and worship and respond to God's word. All right, Lifehouse fam, we're going to close out in prayer. Man, we just want to say thank you for joining us today on our third birthday. Don't forget we have started we have started services in person 
again at the Kiln Creek Regal Theater. And we would love for you to come out and join us. If it's your first time with us today, joining us online and you are local, come out and join us on, on a Sunday morning, 8.30 and 10.15, right at the Kiln Creek Regal Theater. We would love for you to come out and join us. If you do want to reserve your spot for those services, simply text LIVE to 757-690-2401 one but also two uh if you are out of state or you're not or you're not within this this area here thanks again for joining us we hope you and you, you you enjoyed it if you would like to join a zoom call right right after this and see somebody's face and talk to somebody from our church if you have questions your online host is putting that link in there now uh, if you would just click on that zoom link there will be somebody there to greet you say hi to you and answer any questions you have from our church but we're going to pray and we're just going to thank God for all he did and spoke today. Let's pray. Jesus, we just want to pause. Say thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you for this moment, this opportunity. Thank you for all you've done at LifeHouse in three years. God, it is a God thing. We can look back, see hundreds of people saved, thousands of dollars given. God, lives impacted, lives changed. We thank you for all that you've done. But God, we, we want to see more. There are more people online within this city, God, where you want to help them experience the life you offer as they follow you, do life together, get off the bench and get in the game and leave a legacy and be legacy focused. God, I pray that God, that you would take our church to a brand new level. You would just, each person watching here, God, that there would be a deep desire in their heart to follow you, not follow a, a, a kind of just like made up version in their minds, but they would follow the Jesus of the Bible. A Jesus that, that, that just doesn't say indulge themselves, but a Jesus that says deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow you. And in turn, we get in return the joy, the peace, the hope, the life, the perspective, the rest that you give. I pray that we would be a church of people that follows Jesus, that follows you wherever you lead. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Church, I love you. I'm grateful for you. And we will see you next week for part two of my testimony. Lifehouse, one thing we say around here all the time is don't do life alone. And in the day and age of social distancing, living life alone can be easier than ever. That's why we believe our life groups are crucial to your personal and spiritual growth during this time. With over 10 in-person and online groups, there's bound to be something for every age, schedule, and stage of life. Groups like men and women's groups, Whole Health, a fitness group with various instructors and training methods, Fresh Start, a group for new believers, Financial Peace, a group to help you achieve a debt-free living, The Road Back to You, which is a group using the Enneagram to understand yourself and others better, Election 2020, is a timely group used in the Word of God as a guide to show how we should engage in politics. It all starts the week of September 28th. Sign up today by texting LG to the number on your screen, or as always, go to LifehouseNN.com. Thank you again for joining us online today. We hope you are encouraged and inspired to take the next step on your faith journey. And on behalf of our church, we wanna say that we're praying for you and your family as you navigate this crazy and unprecedented time that we're living in. And our desire at LifeHouse is to help you in any way that we can during this time through prayer, practical help, connecting with people in the community and making sure that they get help as well. If there's any way that we can help, please reach out. During this time more than ever, you need hope and you need encouragement, and that's what our online services are here for. You need to be connected into a church family. And although at this time we can't invite you to join us at a physical location, we can invite you to join us online every Sunday at 9 a.m., 10.30 a.m., or 4.30 p.m. right here at lifehousenn.online.church. In the meantime, you can keep in touch with us through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and lifehousenn.com. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you next Sunday.